So here we go. All right. <laughs> All right, so we are live, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight for Emerging Revoir, Revoir, Revelry. Say that fast five times. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, when we started doing these a few months ago, we wanted it to, it to be very informal and very much like a conversation in a tap room around a tavern. So we figured that tonight we actually would talk to some people who are experts at taverns here on, along the East Coast. And I'm happy to have uh, three people with me who are very well versed in taverns and uh, museums, which is very important to me uh, as a museum person myself. Um, we have Liz Williams from Gatsby's Tavern Museum, executive director, located in lovely historic Alexandria, not too far from me. Then we have Stacy Frazier from Lexington Historical Society, which is also maintains the Buckman Tavern, a great facility. And Sarah Nishaw from uh, Francis Tavern, education and public programs coordinator located obviously downtown New York City. Um, so thank you ladies for be being with us tonight. Um, we hope that uh, you all have as much fun doing this as, as we do narrating this. Um, so to get us going tonight, uh, just to have a very uh, basic question is I'll have you go around the horn here, so to speak. We'll have Liz go first. Just talk about your particular uh, tavern, where it's located uh, as far as, you know, in, in time of history, um, and just a little brief, brief overview of the museum itself. So Liz, I'll have you get started. Great. Um, I, we'll do like a rewind because Gatsby's Tavern Museum is um, post-Revolutionary War. So all the things that um, Stacy and Sarah will be uh, talking about, we, we were after that. So the Articles of Confederation were, were just solidified when my, um, my tavern was built. And Gatsby's is actually two taverns, which confuses some people. So our complex is a 1785 tavern and then the 1792 city tavern and hotel. So we like to tell the story of hospitality evolution and the evolution of America, because in 1785, we were just figuring out what we were going to be as a nation. What does this look like now that we've gotten our freedom for Britain? And now what? So those conversations about um, what that now what was uh, happened in our spaces. So that's the story that we share in our museum is this creation of America through um, the lens of our two taverns. Uh, we're most famous for what we were preserved for. George Washington celebrated his birthday in 1798 and 1799 in our ballroom. So we uh, we, we like to say that uh, George and Martha threw down in our spaces and drank and had a good old time to um, celebrate his birthday. So uh, that's a, our, our space in a nutshell. Yeah, great. Uh, Sarah, how about Francis Tavern? Sure, uh, so Francis Tavern, the building itself was built in 1719. Uh, we're at the, almost the very tip of Manhattan. It wasn't built to be a tavern, it was built to be a house. Um, which is so funny because it's enormous even for a house by today's standards. Um, it's built by the Delancey family. By the time it was built, they decided that the area was too commercial, so they didn't live in it. Um, they rented it out, used it as a warehouse uh, until 1762 when it was purchased by Samuel Francis. Francis had come to New York in 1755, opened up another tavern over on Broadway, doing pretty well, decided he wanted to jump on this new location. It was in a busy area, lots of merchants, lots of sailors coming in and out. Um, and he was really successful at um, what he called the sign of Queen Charlotte or the Queen's Head Tavern. People start calling it Francis Tavern, Sam's Tavern, because he himself was getting kind of well known for running the tavern. Um, and because of its great location, so close to the port, so close to where basically most of the people living in Manhattan were living, um, it became a big meeting place for groups like um, the New York Chamber of Commerce was founded there. Uh, the New York Sons of Liberty started meeting there and in a couple other taverns in the area. And it basically served as this great meeting place to discuss revolution uh, until the British took over the city. And then it wasn't a great place to discuss revolution anymore. Uh, but the thing we're most known for is after the war, um, December 4th, 1783, Washington 
at Francis Tavern with his officers, and it's where he said farewell to his officers before going down and um, resigning his military commission and returning to Mount Vernon. And that's what we're best known for. That's great. All right, Stacy. you know you have to mention George Washington at some point because the other two already have. So. I was just going to say, by the end, we're going to do a who hosted George Washington visit. I, we now know that he's visited all of our taverns. I have to say that I think you guys win. It's not a competition, but I think you've got much cooler visits. Like, he came and had dinner at Monroe Tavern, which um, is one of our taverns that was built in the 1730s. Didn't become a tavern. This is like the worst. I feel so bad for William Monroe. It's like the worst possible timing ever. It's like becoming, you know, I'm trying to think of a company that's really useless right now. Maybe becoming an Uber driver right before pandemic. He became a tavern keeper a few months before, like, the British took over his tavern and, you know, shot stuff up right, you know, the morning of, or the afternoon of April 19th. Um, so bad timing on that. But it was a tavern from December 1774 until, um, actually quite a while, his family kept it going until the 18th. 30s or 40s it depends around the time obviously when the railroad uh came into town like many other places the railroad starts taking over some of the really basic i mean compared to your both of your more city taverns more urban taverns um we're mostly looking at country taverns in lexington we have buckman's tavern and monroe's tavern the one i mentioned um and monroe's was basically it was on the eastern end of lexington closer to boston so it was about a day's walk um, with cattle. So a lot of drovers would come and stay there and, you know, keep their cattle um, on the property. So kind of more of a country look in that case, um, or country, you know, landscape. Um, and then Buckman's Tavern was right in the center of town, right across from the Lexington Common, which is now mostly referred to as the Battle Green, um, because that was where the Battle of Lexington occurred. So the house itself was a witness house um, to the battle. So a lot of people obviously come to visit um, with that, you know, thought in mind, because we know the militia did spend time in the tap room while they were in between, you know, we'd gotten the initial, they'd gotten the initial notification that the regulars were out on the road, um, but no one had, no one had shown up yet, basically, or there hadn't been any, um, any uh, spies come back and say, you know, they're five minutes away, an hour away. So basically there was a group of militia that were just kind of waiting in the tap room until, uh, until the regulars were, were seen. Um, and it was also the tavern where uh, John Hancock's secretary was staying, Robert Lowell was staying. So there was a trunk of papers in Buckman's Tavern that were provincial Congress papers and basically a lot of things that they were really not interested in, in having the British troops um, find. So there's literally, and we even put it in the reenactment every year, which is wonderful. There's literally a scene um, that happened where uh, Paul Revere and Robert Lowell take this chest of Hancock's and basically just run it. <laughs> they just run it out Man. the front door and run it like across the green and down the road, you know, and they're gone. And it's literally, they do in the reenactment where it's almost the same as it was supposedly according to the accounts you know at the actual time where the regulars are like marching down the road and then they're just running with the trunk and everything oh, wow. like, <laughs> <laughs> so it, there's this kind of you know the taverns like people are staying there it's right on the green people are going in for the drink it's a place to keep warm while they're waiting to see what's happening you know like i said provincial congressional papers are being stored there because hancock is staying down the street and his secretary didn't get them so it's kind of one of those sites where it's very much a country tavern but it had sort of this moment where there's a lot going on. And then Monroe, very similar. You know, it's kind of, you've got cattle there most days. And then um, in November 1789, November 4th, you have the president of the country coming and having dinner, you know, up in an upstairs room. So um, really pretty exciting. But again, sort of that like Lexington's a country town, but also this really important stuff happened. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. you know, it's also now that's part of our tourism and, you know, the focus. Right. So, mm -hmm. the so one thing is, one of the things I'm going to bring up is I've I've worked at Gatsby's Tavern. I actually still work part time with Liz occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. Uh, so I've worked at I've worked at Gatsby's since 2003. But uh, one of the questions we always get on tour is people come in, they don't really know what a tavern is, right? Like, what is a tavern? It seems very basic, but it's a it's a great question. So does anybody want to kind of tackle what a tavern is? is and you always get the question what's an inn what's an ordinary what's a tavern and what's a hotel so i'm just going to open that up to you all feel free to jump in if you want to tackle that just so if you're people watching who might not know exactly you know what a tavern did and how it served the community that it was in don't all speak at once 
I mean, I think well, it's tough. And we've all, I'm sure, had this question. And it's tough because I'm not sure there's anything that, you know, anything modern that's exactly comparable. So it's a little tricky to par- like parse. Mm-hmm. Like you said, it is kind of like either a hotel or an Airbnb where you're staying, you could stay at someone's, you know, house, basically. You might share a room or whatever. It's almost like a hostel, too. But then I always think of it, and I talk to visitors sometimes about it being more in the style of, like, an English pub, where, you know, it's not a bar where you're going and just knocking down shots or something. Like, you're going and you're having a meal. You're bringing your dog. You're, you know, having meetings in a back room at a Lexington Chamber, or, excuse me, Board of Selectmen met, you know, in rooms at the tavern. So kind of a community space kind of hubby i don't know what do you guys say when you have to answer <laughs> well i usually break up the the tavern into space like space uses so right. it's food and drink there's the entertainment spaces there's the lodging spaces and all of that is a tavern so it's it's easy to um make that connection with the food and drink part so the the public dining rooms the private dining rooms and like the rental use of space in a hotel today people are like oh yeah Yeah. you know and the the entertainment space is um you know you equate that to your hotel ballroom sometimes and um and then you know your the lodging space which is always fun because you know the modern traveler is staying in a hotel room with your own bathroom and your own bedroom, your own room, and then and your you know, own bed. You don't yeah. have to share with <laughs> exactly. So to take them, you know, our dormers are on the third floor. So to take them upstairs and be like, okay, here you go. You're spending the night with, you know, the dude you were drinking with downstairs. Um, is is fun to to you know make those modern connections, but then for people to understand, okay, it's slightly different than you know what we have today. Yeah, when uh, um, I got my start at Francis Tavern working with the school program, so trying to explain how it's different from just, you know, normal restaurants today to a bunch of 10 year olds um, can be hard sometimes at uh, Francis, the ground floor was public dining, if you want to just come in and talk to whoever. Second floor, we had private rooms, you could rent it out for a party, a dance. You could rent it out for whatever. On the third floor, uh, Samuel Francis lived there with his wife and their seven children and some indentured servants and some enslaved members of the household. And they took in some long-term boarders. We know that he didn't really like to just have the general, like anyone traveling who needs a place to stay. There wasn't really the space for it. So it's also not just like a hotel, but like like, like, like you would like get like a dorm room or something. If you're, I'm going to stay in New York for six months and do this and I can find a space maybe somewhere where I could also get food. <laughs> right. So, I think, when, sorry, oh, Bravo, I was going to say, I think the lodging part is also a really good place to talk about expectations of privacy. Mm-hmm. Now they're so vastly different, yeah. you know, in, in any other century, but yeah, that idea of like, you know, yeah, you're not getting a, a single room, a private room, you're not getting your own bathroom, nobody has a bathroom, it's not, <laughs> it's not just you, no one has a bathroom, so I think there's that, that thing that, you know, resonates with people, because if you see the private homes, you see these, you know, most of our, the private historic houses are wealthier people's houses, so they're big rooms, you know, and you think, oh, this is nice, it's, you're like, yeah, but there's like 10 people in here, <laughs> this is not <laughs> what you're expecting, We wouldn't use it in the same way, you know, the spaces are used differently. I was going to ask you all um, in doing your research and working at your different museums, do you enjoy uh, talking about food ways, drinking, the entertainment side of a tavern? What are some of your favorite parts of interpreting your buildings? Um, Because, you know, I I find taverns are, are fun to interpret because you have so many different things to talk about, right? And so many different programs you can do. I mean, it's a great place to program as far as public programs. You can do talks, dances, you know, foodway programs. So any kind of, uh, you know, any, any favorite type of program or part of a tavern that you enjoy, whether it's a foodways or entertainment or just anything in general? Well, Liz is I, thinking. I can see Liz. Really thinking. hard question. Man. Hard I personally really like talking about taverns and the way that the way people were hanging out and eating and seeing each other and how that intersects with public health. So we talked to the kids a lot about like, yeah, you can smoke a pipe in a tavern. No, you probably didn't bring your own. You were going to rent one. Mm-hmm. No, they didn't clean it. Um, they didn't <laughs> think they had to. They didn't know about germs yet. Um, and it's really interesting because it's such a communal space where you have people. Um, sometimes at more rural taverns, it's people who are at least local to the area, but in places on the coast, places like New York City, you're potentially 
getting exposed to people and ideas and germs from all over the world um, that you didn't even know existed. <laughs> um, and it's a good way to get people thinking about like, oh, what are we like now? I want to go wash my hands, and especially now I want to wash right, my hands. Right, right. <laughs> Very relevant, very relevant. Imagine you sat down in a restaurant and they were serving punch and you right, didn't want to punch wait for bowl. a cup, so you just take it out of the bowl. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, I think that's a good, I mean, I think the food waste thing, like you said, it is so different and there's so many elements to it because you can focus on, you know, drinks and you can focus on the meals. And like we said, you know, we've got at Buckman, for example, we've got the, the main tap room. And then we have the West Room, which could have been a private dining space. We have a, par a small parlor that could have been, you know, a women's kind of tea room, that kind of thing. So that idea of the different things you can do. And, you know, and like you guys have mentioned, the in some part based on the spaces, what kinds of conversations you're having, you know, that the women in the tea room are probably a slightly different tone maybe than the farmer in the tap room. But, at, you know, in March of 1775, it's very possible that everybody's still talking about similar things, you know, British taxation and, and things like that. So I think that's kind of a cool way to look at the, how different people in the community may have used it for, um, for different uses too over the years. That's probably the most, the most interesting, I think, for a lot of people. And we've also, part of our tavern was also the post office in Lexington from 1813 mm -hmm. um, for about 10, 15 years, I think. Um, and then it was, you know, later on, it was a community center. The Red Cross used it to roll bandages and stuff in World War One. So there's also other things that we can kind of transition into. But I like that idea of the tavern sort of being, you know, it's, it is a communal space with all the, the germs and stuff that it entails. <laughs> Well, like for Gatsby's, we have like the, the micro level and the macro level. So the, the macro level of, you know, the, the, the national story and how little pieces of it you can see in our spaces. So one of the things we talk about is the election of 1800, because besides George Washington, we also had Thomas Jefferson come hang out with us twice, actually. Um, and the, the relationship of that story when he spends the night after visiting Martha Washington um, in this tumultuous time of who's going to be president right after the the tie of Jefferson and Aaron Burr and the nation is like what do, I don't know who's going to be president let's find out from the House of Representatives so you know he spends the night with us after visiting Martha and then actually comes back once he's uh, elected president for his inaugural banquet in our ballroom so for the the macro lover of of our national story is super cool to share in our spaces and then on a smaller level food and drink is very easy to um, have fun with and um, make that connection with the public because uh, people like to eat and like to drink and uh, but my personal favorite when Rob you were talking about public programming we talk about the entertainments of the tavern and my personal favorite is Toby the Learned Pig where the learned pig would come to many different taverns all across the mid Atlantic to entertain guests. And um, the pig could read and read minds and do math and all these exciting things. And um, we, we, it, it's a, a story that kids love. I love it. everybody loves. So um, when we were working on a summer program for kids, I was, cause I have kids myself now they're teenagers is terrible but long ago they weren't so I'm flipping through and I found this um this pig that uh was like a learned pig out of Maryland so we were talking as a staff like wouldn't it be great if we had a learned pig come to the tavern so we did and it was so cool and mm -hmm. so um Pam the learned ham came to the tavern and entertained kids and we made that historical connection for people that day and it was um really awesome to see so that's yeah. my my public program story so we're getting a few we're getting a few questions here um i'll throw them out there i have to give props to drew gruber a good friend of mine down in colonial williamsburg wants to know if any of you all can discuss one of the most epic bar tabs at your tavern if you know what they are if there's any epic bar tab I don't know anything of Gatsby's, Liz. Maybe you do. Well, you know, I'm going to put this as a public plea. If anyone has any uh, city, tavern, and hotel um, paperwork in a trunk in their <laughs> attic um, or they're sitting on it in, you know, somewhere else, I would love to have it. Um, we have so very little primary documents that we can work from. We have, um, and there's a, a very few in our collection, and there's a few others that are in different collections. So I've seen... Um, I think two or three 
um, bills, tavern bills. And it's hard to compare if the one that we have in our collection is um, epically huge. Um, but we do like to mention that when Thomas Jefferson stayed with us, he um, wrote in his memorandum book that he, he paid five fifty for dinner and lodging and 75 cents as a tip to the enslaved staff of the tavern. Hmm. And um, five fifty is big. So um, we suspect, uh, thanks to uh, our work with Monticello, that Jefferson is traveling with another person, um, another senator. So it was um, two guys mm. drinking and lodging. But even still, 550 at that time was a really, really big hotel bill. So maybe they're drinking a lot of Bandera. Hard to say. Didn't line item it, unfortunately. But um, but it's you know we have so little primary documents with the, that type of number. It's really hard for us to tell, which is right. a huge downer. Yeah, yeah, I second that. We don't have a lot of, um, or to my knowledge, really any primary documents from when Samuel Francis was running the tavern. Uh, but I have to imagine our biggest bar tab would have been on evacuation day, November 25th, 1783. The last of the British troops left their last like stronghold in America. They walked down Broadway. There was a big parade led by General Washington. Um, and then the first New York State governor, Governor Clinton, held an open public party at Francis Tavern. So a couple oh, yeah. hundreds of people coming in and out all day. So I'd have to imagine he probably has one of our biggest uh, tabs. I would assume so. <laughs> I would imagine so, yeah. <laughs> we have, so we, we are lucky, I'm realizing now, <clears throat> because we do have um, primary sources for our taverns. Um, we have three ledgers, four Monroe, that are from... You know, I have this information. I just don't feel like looking it up. But basically, it's it's roughly 1760s uh, to about 1810 or so. So it's kind of really bookending the you know the Revolutionary War and sort of. The, I know they're amazing. We just had them all served. Um, so we have three for Buckman's one, or certainly three for Monroe, one for Buckman's, and then we have like a random bill. The problem, of course, is that you know we've we've preserved them and we've uh, digitized them. We have not transcribed them, and like nobody has any time to do that right now. Who you know is busy with other things. But either way, they're really cool. We did pull some material from them. Um, one thing that is on there, which I love, is that because, like I said, it's kind of more of a country tavern. You know, other than some really important events in 1775 and 1789. You know, Lexington's a pretty chill little agricultural town so a lot of it is just the really fun stuff where it's like you start looking at the books and you're like Thaddeus Harrington was in for at least one or two flips at least every day <laughs> and you start looking going holy yep. like, he's still here two months later coming in like every day <laughs> like and he very much has a problem so I'd say <laughs> Thaddeus Harrington's bill over the course of his lifetime maybe <laughs> pretty high um but then my favorite one that I don't know, and I would love to know if they even charged him, I'm guessing they didn't, um, at the Centennial in 1875, the Centennial of the Battles of Lexington and Concord, um, there was a huge, you know, publicity drama because Lexington and Concord don't share power well on the um, who had the first battle thing. It's, it's we're historically not known for, for doing a good job with balancing that power, but um the point is that we had written to Grant, the town of Lexington wrote to Gen uh, President Grant and said, will you come and, and visit Lexington for the centennial in 75? And then um, Conquer wrote to him and said, will you come and visit? And basically Grant was like, mm, you guys figure it out amongst yourselves. I'm not going to get in between that. You figure it out. Let me know where you want me. Um, and I mean, the New York Times even wrote about like, Lexington and Concord are fighting over where Grant is going. <laughs> What's happening here? So in the end, they decided to split the day. Uh, Grant went to Concord first. Um, so many, there were so many people in the plat speaker's platform that I believe it collapsed partially. So there was a delay. Um, it was a freezing cold day. Like it was, you know, it was April 19th, but sometimes that is balmy and sometimes that is very cold, as you guys know. There's often, especially in New England, there's sometimes we've had some snowy and icy mornings. So it was such a cold day that we, Lexington sent up, set up all these uh, tents on the battle green, on the common, with tables, with, you know, big containers of fruit, oranges, and all kinds of, you know, fancy things. It was so cold that day that the fruit froze on the table. Wow. Because um, everything got delayed, you know. And actually what ended up happening is that when Grant got there finally from Concord, 
he ended up going before speaking, he went into Buckman's and had a glass of brandy um, to sort of warm up and revive himself. And I think Grant, that was, a, that was pretty common for him. <laughs> I understand his grand drank quite a bit. Um, so it was just like, just imagine sort of being there because it wasn't, it wasn't planned part of the stop. I think it was just, you know, he had been mm-hmm. out too long. He was cold. He needed to warm up before he could give a speech. And so he went into Buckman and, and had a, a brandy before he went in. So I love to be like, the tavern keeper and just be like, oh, I'm not gonna, he's the president, right? I can't charge right. him. <laughs> like, that, that would be weird. <laughs> or, you know, so one of his men is slipping, uh, you know, some money up the side. I don't know. But that would be a really cool bill to find if we could find that day. <laughs> um, another question, we're, we're getting a lot of questions actually, which is great. Um, Mike Cecier, another good historian here in Virginia, has a question about, um, you know, today people go out for the holidays, they go out for dinner. Was that something that was typical in the 18th century at taverns? Um, not just for the holidays, but also think about the families, the family get together and go have dinner at a tavern like we get together and go to a dinner at a restaurant. Do you guys have evidence Well, I, I, I think for our thinking faces, I'm realizing. I know, right? You guys all have that same look. <laughs> Well, I think for us, the, um, it, the, the, the timing, because, you know, the, the concept of restaurants, I think, was just kind of starting around our, um, you know, 85, 92 time frame. And, you know, from research, we see from the local newspapers, uh, there is advertisements for like oyster houses or specific places that were highlighting particular chefs. Um, so if you wanted to have uh, uh, this particular chef's meal, you want to come to, you know, this this uh, hotel. So um, we don't necessarily see that in our two spaces uh, for our time period, but it, it certainly was starting to form around the time of our, our taverns and hotels. I think, I mean, most of what we've seen in some of those ledgers and things was mostly... <clears throat> either you know a meeting and having a meal or you know serving a couple of people who are gathered around you know maybe knew each other but not necessarily like large family groups I think a lot of those meals were still taken at home um, during right. that time period especially because there were parts of a tavern still where you know you might not at night want your small child mm-hmm. or your wife or <laughs> <laughs> uh, Samuel Francis did take out um, he was one of the oh, first wow. people doing takeout. He would uh, awesome. order and they'd put it in a box and just hand it to you. So maybe if you couldn't come to the tavern with your kids, you could bring the tavern home with you. Wow. <laughs> oh, and perfect wow. for, you know, that's contactless delivery. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Very relevant today everywhere, right? <laughs> it's got takeout. <laughs> um, that's great. Well, kind of to follow up with that a little bit, uh, another question people have, I'm going to kind of twist it here a little bit. So, um, Talk about, if you can, like pricing, how, how pricing was done at t- in, in 18th century taverns as far as, um, you know, an average meal. I know Liz mentioned a little bit about Thomas Jefferson splurging in there a little bit on his visit to Gatsby's. But talk a little bit about, um, you know, the pricing for a meal, pricing for lodging. Um, and if you want to tie in a little bit about any kind of um, – we always hear the stories about, you know, how the government controlled the pricing and, and all the different, um, and some of it's urban legends, some of it's is true. But if you can talk about some of the regulations that taverns had and how that maybe relate to pricing for taverns as well. Well, thank God for primary documents because it. Um we know what the pricing should have been because from the very few bills that I've seen, again, like the two, um, we know what pricing was in 1801 for Alexandria. It was 50 cents for, um, for dinner, not for dinner. 50 cents, a government set price for dinner with a beer or a cider. Mm. So, so you, got your, you got a drink with your dinner. Um, and then also at this time, if you were selling alcohol, you needed to have space for lodging. So you had to have that, that upstairs space, which I think in today's land might not be a terrible idea either. Um, mm. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so it was 50 cents in 1801. And then we know, I know around uh, the time John left to go to uh, Baltimore in 1808, the um, overnight stay was around a dollar, dollar fifty. So, and it, it's, it stayed there for a really long time. 
I'm honestly embarrassed. I, like, what I'm trying to do right now is fine. That's why I look really distracted. <laughs> I'm trying to find one of our primary sources. It's not working. I, computer, I had mine up on my computer, so. I, I guess that was smart. No, my computer went kaput a while ago. So some of the, like, fairly recently. So a lot of the stuff that I had saved locally, not on my server, on our server. It's, it's like it's on the server somewhere, but I would take a while to find it. But, yeah, I mean, we have... The interesting thing, too, is we also have the comparison where at um, Monroe's in particular, because it wasn't a tavern until 1774, it was a store before that. So we can also look at things and be like, oh, Reverend Jonas Clark, who was a, you know, fiery patriotic minister, he's the, he was the, married to John Hancock's cousin, which is why Hancock and Adams stayed at the Hancock Clark house when they were in town. You know, we can look and say, oh, he went and bought, you know, this much uh, chocolate to make hot chocolate. Um from you know Monroe at this price you know on this day so it's nice to kind of see the not just that stuff but looking at we didn't exhibit actually we call it sugar and sundries you know the kind of the other stuff too the stuff that you might pick up at a tavern or you might you know if you're going to um, a store but I, I think some taverns too especially would like sell you some sugar or eggs so there's it's nice when you see that broad range where you can say okay here's a prepared meal but also you could potentially get you know ingredients at you know a tavern or a store go home and make it obviously um so yeah, it is. I mean, and it's, it's almost like seeing the markup. <laughs> like, so know. this egg on its own was this much, but then you cooked it and it's this much more. <laughs> so it is interesting to have that range, you know, to see the, the raw supplies and then also how much things are costing. And if I find that bill, I will tell you what things cost. All right, sure, we'll share it. I'm jealous of all your primary sources. We don't really uh, have that many <laughs> to work off of. Really so got lucky. People are asking your favorite drinks. I'm assuming they mean tavern drinks or what you're drinking now. You can share either or. Um, <laughs> but think about your particular tavern where you're located and if there's a favorite beverage that either you knew was served at your tavern or just taverns in general. And for those who do food waste today, is that something you all make today? Samuel Francis, I know, is known for serving rum punch. That was like his big thing. Lot, lots of different alcohols of that besides rum. Um, right. Currently, the museum is, we're on the second and third floor of the building, and we actually go into the above floors of surrounding buildings that we are connected to. And on the first floor uh, is a independently operated restaurant. Um, we're there, it's not quite, you know, 18th century tavern food, but very much in the spirit of that so you can't get rum punch but there is an awful lot of a uh, beer and there's a whiskey bar down there and everything nice that's nice yeah <laughs> well, Liz, similar to well similar to francie's we also have a, a restaurant that um is operated within our space and um it, i usually say it's mm -hmm. a in, period inspired food so um favorite drink i i drink beer normally so that's an people drank beer in the taverns the so that's kind of easy for me but a uh, uh, public program we've been doing uh, for the past couple of years actually it's called history by the glass so we take these um, different pieces of history in our tavern and then we partner with a local mixologist who creates these amazing cocktails related to whatever theme we're doing. So um, we've done whiskey, we've done ice. So every cocktail had these amazing ice cubes. Uh, we were uh, uh, preparing to do one for tea before we had to close down. But it's, it's a really fun way to tie in history and um, modern cocktail culture mm -hmm. to, um, and, and they're all really magical drinks. So it's, um, it's really hard. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the, the reason we created this program was when we were doing research for the Civil War, we um, discovered that our space had a secret bar. So there was a reporter who was embedded with um, uh, Union forces coming down into Alexandria, and he noted that our tavern keeper at the time, Samuel Heffelbauer, had um, this space where his um, his manager would take people in the darkness, basically, um, and would people were drinking cobblers and um, other different types of drinks um, in the darkness. So we thought it would be a really amazing program to um, have a our you know Civil War. Um, speakeasy basically mm -hmm. and um, our 
local mixologist helped us with that, Brandon, and uh, he had so much fun and we had so much fun that we did all these fun cocktails. Sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> jealous. Really we had hard. I've never done that with a mixologist, but it sounds fun because there, I mean, there are so many wonderful um, mixed drinks. And like you said, it kind of picks up of, picks up on, you know, the fascination with the cocktail. And in fact, like one of, one of, like I was saying for Hattie's Harrington, one of the most common drinks we see sold in our taverns up here is Flip. Um, so seeing that and saying, okay, well, that's, you know, that's a fun combination because you've got beer and brandy and glasses and eggs and, you know, and, and obviously that's a very, sh it can be very showman like um, kind of drink because if you're actually doing it and heating it with a poker, it's like incredibly dramatic. Magical. Yep. Um, that said, it's not something that we've found particularly easy to translate to an education program <laughs> or to any what? kind of a program where you've got, you know, hot <laughs> pokers. So we were trying to figure out how, to, how we can do that because I know there are some things you can do like a glass rod to heat it up instead and stuff. So I think yeah, that's one of the most common ones. I think it's a fun thing because you can usually it's like a stout or something that's kind of dark. And obviously those are, you know, people are creating different ones, uh, different types of that kind of thing all the time with, with um, the way craft brewing is. Um, so, yeah, I think it's fun just to pick, even like to pick. We, we ended up doing um, when we did our CVS exhibit in the CVS pharmacy windows is we do, we actually in the last one had a couple of recipes. We had like a flip recipe and another one just be like, you know, try them and see what you think, you know, and it's just fun because like you said, it, people like, to drink but people also like to be creative they like to see if they could recreate a recipe or like improve a recipe i mean how many youtube channels are there to like improving a recipe that you found somewhere else so this right. kind of thing i think is a fun way and the resources exist you know we have there are 18th century cookbooks and 19th century cookbooks mm -hmm. you might it might not translate directly like something from virginia might not be exactly the same as up here based on what's available but you know you can you can come by stuff where you've got some guidelines on how to make fun different you know drinks which i think is really right like that. <laughs> so real quick room temperature or were they iced because that's that's a couple that's a couple of questions we're getting right now room temperature drinks or were they iced drinks well some of them had a boiling hot poker <laughs> stuck inside that's them. true <laughs> <laughs> the opposite <laughs> i think the majority were at room temperature but um the gadsby's because we're fancy um we have a an ice well a commercial size ice well that john wise when he was um constructing the buildings he uh, built and then asked for permission afterward but whatever um mm. so it was a just it really it. ginormous uh space to store ice and uh from you know most research we've seen it's not a ton of ice in your cocktails but there is one reference to um, a space in Philadelphia that Thomas Jefferson wrote about when he was um, living there that they did serve drinks with an ice cube in it so um, it's kind of both okay if you're super fair. fancy and have access to ice then right because <laughs> it was super expensive to get and super hard to get and it's a process yeah. so uh, yeah. yeah yeah um there's a there's a good debate going on here on a chat about women's roles in tavern can you all tackle that yeah, there's some <laughs> misconceptions i know the answer to that because i worked at a tavern so there's some misconceptions about women owning taverns, women working at taverns. I know if you go to Colonial Williamsburg, you get the tavern winches, which is so kind of passe. But um, can someone speak to the role of women? Because we have a good conversation going over here on chat about uh, people not knowing women actually own taverns, which we know they did. So Yes. Actually, one of um, in talking about our complicated building, when we have our two different taverns, um, the 1785 tavern turned into a coffee house. So like a tavern, but um, you had to pay for membership. And one of the people who owned that and ran it was Hannah Griffith. So women for sure. And this was one of the, you know, kind of few industries that women could be in. Um, had a role to play, made money. Um, there's a, a ton of different um, women's stories of uh, owning and operating taverns. So um, if, uh, if you, your husband died, then you could keep going, which was you know, a good thing for women in the 18th century because there wasn't that much they could um, do for their own, um, their own money and their own agency. So um so yes women were were leaders and owned and ran taverns cheers 
Cheers. <laughs> well how often, how often do they go taverns? Because that's also another discussion here about women actually in taverns. You know, sometimes you go to a tavern museum and you're told women went over here, men went over there. Um, how accurate is that? And if you guys can kind of speak to that. I mean, I think again, to some degree, it's it is a sense that you know women women have power in the 18th century, but it's structured in a different way you know, and, and not always the way they were expecting, where it's sort of a, there is sort of a private public sphere situation thing where, you know, your wife might be going, or a, a woman might be going to, you know, a shop or a bar to do the shopping, to meet with friends, that kind of thing. But like, they're not going to be there for a board of selectmen's meeting because they're not, you know, serving an official capacity. So I think the fact that, like we said, taverns encompass a lot of different community activities means that, you know, you are seeing women, they're not necessarily pounding shots or taking notes, um, like, for an official town meeting, you know, but they're there buying something, you know, picking up something, dropping off something, having to you the friend, that kind of thing. Um, or coming to think, an entertainment that, you know, right. that a, a tavern or a dance. Was I mean, hosting. we have, we yeah, have a ballroom balls. upstairs. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And that was obviously something that would have been, I mean, the, the invitations go usually to, you know, the young women in the, um, the families and stuff. And a lot of the ephemera we have, the tickets and stuff, because um, they're the ones who are going to come. They want to come. Um, the other thing just to tie into that is that sort of being, you know, a wife of like, so Ruth Buckman was running Buckman's Tavern with her husband, John, and, you know, he's, when he's doing other things he needs to be doing, he's out doing stuff. She's, you know, the one making the meals in the tavern. She's the one really keeping it running. Um, and I know that sort of feels like, a, oh, but she at least had that, you know, <laughs> sort of like a toss her a bone thing, but like, that's a monumental undertaking mm -hmm. to run, you know, a public business in addition to your household at the same time in a very public space in the center of town where you get a lot of people in and out with different needs and expectations like that's a that's a really extensive career that's like um marketing person and chef and like rentals coordinator and a million other jobs all in one it's like a museum job right M multiple yeah. hats, yeah. Multiple hats. <laughs> <laughs> all right um so there's lots of debate going on over here about that, but we'll we'll go back to some other questions here. Um, so uh, talking about other audiences that haven't really been interpreted all that much, and you know, in the in the beginning of tavern museums, but which are really important today, is research on enslaved people in these buildings. Um, and I, I know Gatsby's been doing some research because I worked there, but. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about maybe some of the efforts you all are doing to start to interpret these other populations that are actually a very important part of, of taverns? I know, obviously, in Virginia, the slavery lasts much longer than it does in New York and Massachusetts, but um, I know it's been very difficult to, to research this stuff because it's not always well documented. But if you guys can kind of share some of the information you all have been working on um, or, or some of the enslaved peoples that were actually in your buildings. Um, yeah, so we... Um, as I said before, we don't have a lot of primary sources or really any kind of sources from when Samuel Francis was there. We know that he um, was involved in the slave trade. He did have several enslaved people at the tavern. Uh, and we know this mainly from doctor's bills. We have a bill from a doctor who came and prescribed, you know, this for your wife and this for your slave and this for your daughter. So we know they were there, but we don't really know much about them and it's kind of a big hole in our collection because New York at the time that it was you know France's tavern was very deeply involved in the institution of slavery you know all the major things were built by enslaved people most likely the building itself uh, we were just a few blocks away from where one of the biggest slave markets in New York was at the foot of Wall Street um, so it is something that was so important to the history of New York and to the tavern itself. And we're really only now just starting to be able to kind of look and see, like we can see where the holes are and now we just have to keep going to try to find and anything to, uh, to fill that in when we have so few sources about Samuel Francis at all. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're certainly all catching up on, you know, where we ideally would have been years ago on a lot of this research, I think. Um, we're trying to do more of an effort. We have, you know, so we had certain information about enslaved folks in Lexington in our uh, records. We have a few bills of sale and things like that. Um, but in terms of sort of placing people in houses and things, we're starting to put that together. We know there were two enslaved people living in um, John Hancock, in the Hancock Clark house. Um, 
were, they belonged to the first, well, not the first John Hancock, but John Hancock, we all know his grandfather was the, the minister in Lexington and that's who built the house. Um, so we know that there were at least two people living there and we're trying to look at interpreting them. Um, we've had an intern do some research recently that in part was new research um, and in part was pulling together what, you know, every 10 years or so, somebody would write a paper about black people in Lexington and, you know, do the best they could for the generation they were in or the decade they were in. And then it got filed somewhere. And, you know, so actually doing something hopefully at this point, um, but even new research that we didn't know about. So things like he found, you know, our, our intern this fall found a historical newspaper ad where a, an enslaved person had had run away, had escaped, and had come to Buckman Tavern asking for work. And basically, Mr. Buckman refused him work, and, and we, according to the ad, reported him um, to whoever he needed to report him to. So you don't always find, you know, what you're looking for in terms of behavior you can praise um, in terms of the owners of the houses and stuff. And that's, you know, that's a conversation we're having a lot in Lexington right now. You know, we realize fairly recently that, or me personally, for at least fairly recently, that all the schools in town are named after, you know, people who own slaves, um, elementary and middle schools. So it's definitely something that's, that's, we're trying to make it more on our mind and feeling like we should have, we should have done this research a long time ago, really. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to do it now. So <laughs> that's hopefully going to expand what we know about um, everyone who's living in town. You know, if people uh, who are enslaved were working at the tavern or coming to the tavern, we do know, you know, that there was a free black man who fought um, at the time he was enslaved, but he fought in the green in Lexington and was uh, emancipated because of it. And we do have records of him drinking um, in the tavern in the 1790s. Um, and then he moved to Western Massachusetts. But even something like that is kind of a nice little bright spot where you're like, oh, look, like, there's, you know, a freed black man who was drinking in this tavern after the war, you know, so he lived through the war, he was emancipated, you know, these are, these are a few, you know, a few little bright spots like that, where you can identify, oh, mm -hmm. there he was having a drink in, you know, June of 1793. <laughs> well, as a Southern tavern, it's, um, you know, John Gadsby made his money off of his enslaved workers. It's a, it's a fact, and it's something that we um, claim as a fact, and we um, weave through the narrative of our um, of our tour. And the the I feel pretty good now about all of the primary documents we have because one of the things that um, we highlight to um, to bring life to the enslaved staff that were at the tavern. It's John Gadsby renegotiated his lease with John Wise to own the buildings in 1802. So in the process of doing that, he had to create his um, list of collateral. So all of his property and all the stuff he owned. So thank God he was renegotiating his lease. because Now we know exactly what was in all of the spaces in the 1792 building and then kinda the 1785 building, but um, it helps our interpretation, but it also helps us know who exactly was in this building because he listed his enslaved people on the inventory. So we know um, he had two Moseses. He, and Moses, I, I wish I could knew more about him because there was a one Moses that was uh, specially designated as his wine steward. And John Gadsby, uh, the more I research about him, he loved his wine. He was like a wine hoarder. And um, so it's a, a really uh, important job at a tavern to be the wine steward. And the fact that it, he was designated on this list is something that we, we tell that story. He is an important man to this operation. So it, it's the and newspaper articles and ads and runaway ads. You can kind of piece together the the larger enslaved narrative and for alexandria too we had we're in a unique geography because we were a slave city um, a southern city with slavery but we also had a really large free black community so we had this um, really interesting urban dynamic of um, this robust free black community um, the enslaved staff of people at institutions but then also um, people were renting out others. So you can kind of see that in the census as well. So we can create this broader story of all the different people that were at the tavern and how they all interconnected to um, tell the story of a tavern. And I'm 
it's something that we we continue to work toward and um, you know try to find additional information so we can broaden that story better yeah it's well, think, not to return to the the women part as much but i think that's really important to recognize you know that obviously it's been going on for a long time in the historical field but that we're trying to look really as much as we can on that invisible labor you know gatsby and, and francis and buckman and monroe have their names on the tavern but they absolutely could not have done it alone so there's all this framework and structure and support that actually run the tavern right right um yeah i, I know it's i know it's been difficult research wise i know like you know liz has been doing good work there in alexandria so i was that's why i brought it up because i know it's something that everybody's kind of working on right now um and to try to tell that whole the whole story um one question we have here it is a loaded question so uh <laughs> right at free. the end <laughs> uh, yeah i have some really i have some really <laughs> soft i got some great softball questions after this one uh, okay. but it, it's actually an important question and it it's i haven't really gotten to it and i should get to it but um why are why do you all think taverns were so important to the, the you know, the Revolutionary War movement and the founding of the country. Like taverns are, in my opinion, this is me personal, my personal opinion, taverns are so important in, in developing that spirit of revolution and, and watching the watching these colonies shift into a country. And then like in Gatsby's Tavern at where Liz works, forming a, forming a government. And these taverns play such huge roles in that. Um, so why do you think that is? Why, in your personal opinion or your professional opinion, I should say, why do you think taverns play such a huge role in watching that, that spirit of revolution and forming into a new country? I know, right, so it's I, I know it's loaded, so. I have a theory. I'm just going to shoot it out there. If you guys hate it, I will not be at all offended because I'm making it up right now. <laughs> um, to some degree, you know, we always talk about the third place, you know, we sort of have our work and our, you know, schools and churches and stuff. And then museums and other places can sometimes be a place outside of that normal environment where you can talk more freely. And I feel like to some degree, there's that like bumping into people in the tavern, having meetings and things, running into people in a more relaxed atmosphere where, you know, it's, yeah, you see each other at church on Sunday all day, sitting on a hard bench, but you know, you're not going to just turn to somebody and start having a leisurely chat about liberty, you know, in the middle of a, a sermon. Um, and, you know, and, and work, you know, work is obviously a lot more physical those days in those days too. You're not standing around a coffee maker or a water cooler with your, your peers. Most of the time you're building something or, you know, merchants, obviously it's a different thing, but generally, I, I don't know, to some degree, I feel like it could be this place where you're not, you don't have any obligations necessarily. And you're free to kind of talk in a more comfortable atmosphere about, you know, what's, what's on your mind. And, you know, and obviously because it's a tavern and it's not owned by like, you know, Hilton, you know the tavern keeper. You know if like you're saying seditious things, he's not gonna you know drop a dime on you. Like you're good if you go to this tavern or whatever. So there's some safety in that too. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, I think taverns were a great place where you could not only like see your neighbors in this extra place, but people you might not see people just passing through. Um, if you're in a port city, you're getting people from all over the place, and it makes it a great kind of like going on like Twitter today, I can go on Twitter and I could find out, well, what does someone think about current events who's living in California? Or my friend lives in Prague and I can see what she's thinking about there. Taverns gave you that space where you're getting people who may live in the area, may live somewhere else, and they can relax and they can talk about what they want. Um, and basically most people can go to a tavern. It was a place where you could go and be in you know, you couldn't, it's not like you had to be a member of your congregation. You can meet people who are in different churches, people who are in different professions. And it really can expand what your thinking is on an issue because maybe you think this because you're a farmer and then you travel to New York to sell the stuff you were farming and you meet a merchant who thinks this. And, you know, you have all these different opinions that you might not get in an age where you had relatively low literacy rates. So people weren't always being able to go to school and read things and learn about the world and form opinions that way. I would agree with all the things y'all said. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the one thing, you know, I um, like being the later tavern, uh, it, the taking these ideals and these conversations that were happening in revolutionary era taverns and then kind of shifting it to um, post-life, you see the, you know, the 
conversations with people about what does liberty mean? What does, you know, what does independence mean? And there's around this time now with, you know, building up to the election of 1800, there are differences of opinion. And um, it begins this kind of uh, faction creation. And there's this really brilliant book um, in civility. So like in civility, but I-N-N civility that talks really uh, a lot about this, um, this dialogue that's happening at the revolution and post-revolution about these ideals. And um, it, there were certain taverns uh, in most major cities that if you were uh, a federalist, you could go to that one, but don't go to that other one because you might get beat up. So um, there's some dynamics in play at this time about, uh, yes, conversations are happening in a space, but they are starting to um, shift into camps and uh, you see that in um, cities and you read about it in in the book and stuff like that but um, that's the interesting part of our story is we can we can share kind of how how, how the nation has uh, moved to that yeah one not, not to make it about movies but you know on uh, john adams may series which i love so much Lots of inaccuracies, but it's a great movie. There's that scene where they go to a tavern and Ben Franklin's talking to everyone and they're making all the side deals to get the declaration passed in the tavern. And it's such a great scene. And, you know, it kind of gives you that, you know, I'm not saying it happened every day, but it kind of gives you that that feeling. And it happens today, too. If you talk to any lobbyist or staffer in D.C., the deals are made at the bar, Absolutely. not in the halls of Congress. And so that hasn't really changed a whole lot today. So, all right, a couple of easy questions for you before we let you go. So best, your best resource on tavern, best book. People are asking what they can read about to, to read, to learn more about taverns. So I'll give you, each of you get one, just one book, Liz. I know that's going to be hard, but just one. <laughs> what, what was the one you just recommended, Liz? That I'm going to go with that one because that's the, you know. What was I'm that one? Ball. So um, I'm going to probably butcher his last name. Hold on. In, in civility. So it's I-N-N -N civility. And it's done, uh, written by Vaughn Scribner, S-K-R-I-B-N-E-R. -E totally amazing book. Okay. You all want to, uh, Stacy or Sarah want to share? It Sarah could be any book. resource. It doesn't have to be a book. It could be any resource. People could go <laughs> to find out more about taverns. Yeah. Um, I would recommend this one book. It's called America Walks Into a Bar by Christine Sismondo. Mm -hmm. I really like it. I like it because it covers not just taverns, but kind of like how has um, bars and drinking culture kind of been instrumental in the way that America has developed. Hmm. All right. Stacy, you can say your web you can say your website if you want. <laughs> I mean, our website doesn't have enough material on towers. <laughs> no, I mean we've, you know, there's some really great resources out there, and I think that's one thing that we're lucky that you know a lot of people have looked at at, at you know, it's certainly not a topic that there isn't some good information on. That idea of people talking in sort of the coffee house tavern space, I think, has been visited a lot by historians, and there's some great content out there. Um, I think, you know, this is going to sound stupid, but like, when we get ours digitized, you should look at our tavern ledgers. <laughs> but really, I mean, there is that element, like we we're saying, I, I'm, I'm realizing in part when I talk to you guys, how lucky we are to have those resources and how much we really need to be doing more with them. Because you can, you know, like I said, we are to, to large degree without on the days when troops don't march into town and the president doesn't come to visit, like it's a pretty calm, chill town. It's much more at the time in the 18th century, they were much more of like country taverns. So you really get that sense of that ebb and flow and like what people are buying and what people are, you know, Reverend Clark, the minister loves his hot chocolate, which is kind of a fun little, you know. So I think that's the other thing is if you do live in a town that does have early tavern records or those kinds of things or historical society, that just reading through those, I've like, as I told you, there's four of them. I have read through maybe one of them fully and the other ones like little parts. And even so, there's all these great little stories and, and informational trends too that you can see, you know, what are we buying more of this during the war years and more of less of that during, you know, this time period when you know something else is going on in town. 
Um, so I think, you know, when we have the news break, because like I said, you can see prices for everything. You can really get a sense of what, you know, how much more is something like a glass of rum going to cost in New England or less in New England because we have good supply and more somewhere else, you know, in New Hampshire, for example, or even going 100 miles north is, is going to reduce your supply. Um, so when you have those resources, I think that's really cool. But I do not have a good secondary source to recommend. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, some people are saying Rum Punch, Re Rum Punch and Revolution, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I know I've actually read by Pierre Thompson. That's a good book as well. So I think it's focused on Philadelphia, but uh, it's still very relevant to uh, 18th century taverns in general. Um, so as we're going to wrap up here, I promised you all eight o'clock, a little bit late, a little bit late, which is great because people are asking some good questions. So I know uh, we were talking before we went live how we are museum professionals and we're all closed down right now. Uh, physically closed down doesn't mean we're virtually closed down so I'll let each of you kind of promote some of the work that you all are doing at your museums on your social media pages whether it be Facebook Twitter Instagram or your website so people can actually when they get off this get off the zoom call tonight and they can actually go visit your some of your social media and learn some things about your museum so I'm just going to let open it open up the floor Liz you go first you've been going first it works <laughs> <laughs> Unless you don't want to. <laughs> she's going she's gonna to call me later and yell at me for that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <Anyway. laughs> well, uh, Gatsby's Tavern Museum is part of the city of Alexandria. So we're, we're part of the Office of Historic Alexandria. So we're one of a number of um, museums that the city owns. And uh, since we've been closed, we've been doing an initiative called Historic ALX to You. So it's hashtag historic ALX to the number you. Um, and that's been our way to share content and share our stories when everyone's at home. So that's on our Facebook page, that's on our Historic Alexandria VA page and all the other um, different Facebook pages that are uh, our museums. Uh, we're also on Twitter. So um, I, I do tweet as John Gadsby on Twitter for the museum. So he's a, a, a saucy, um, entertaining tavern keeper that, um, gets it in with people. So um, tweet John Gadsby, I'll tweet you back. And then on Instagram, we're uh, you know, also using that platform for you know sharing those stories and, and different things about Alexandria. So um, as the summer goes on, we will be doing some virtual programming around our Alexandria stories and uh, follow all of our pages and you'll see what we're up to in the coming months. Oh, Sarah, I'll let you go. Since Stacy right. wants to go last, it seems. <laughs> That's fine. I'm I was, still thinking. I'm still thinking. <laughs> I was just frantically looking up our social media handles. Um, so we're on Twitter and Instagram. We're at Francis Tavern. Francis is F-R-A-U-N-C-E-S Tavern. Um, and you can check there. We are... We did our first virtual lecture um, last month. We have a couple more lined up that we'll be posting about soon. Um, you can also go on our website, francistavernmuseum.org. We were able to put up a virtual exhibit of one of our past exhibits that has um, the entire tour that I wrote for that exhibit as an intern um, built into it because I had those files at home. So I was able to use them. Um, we have some great act, like learning activities for kids. If you have kids who aren't completely fed up with doing schoolwork at home by now. Um, and we have our, we launched a podcast. We only have two episodes so far. It's called Tavern Talks. That's on, I think, any platform you can find podcasts. Um, they're really great. Uh, so yeah, I just keep an eye on our website, our social media, because it, it seems like things change from day to day yes, all the time. So it's, announcements will be coming though we have a lot planned so okay great um so yeah so we're lexington historical society it's a private nonprofit um that is uh the steward of three historic houses and one historic railroad depot um so hancock clark house Monroe tavern and buckman tavern and then the lexington depot um we have been similarly working from home since mid-march uh we closed our historic houses um Right now, what we're trying to work on is encouraging visitors to come and see our historic landscapes. Uh, we have properties that have a lot of beautiful flower gardens and some that have, you know, colonial era or style herb gardens and kitchen gardens. Um, and we're hoping to have some programming like exterior tours and things like that coming along soon. Um, 
we actually shifted into virtual programming fairly early by necessity. Um, we basically closed everything down and within a, month, a week or two of everything closing down mid-March, uh, the town of Lexington decided they had to cancel Patriot's Day. And that's like a big deal for us. <laughs> like, you know, Patriot's Day is, is our thing. So we ended up doing, it's actually when uh, Robin, uh, some of the other ERW guys and I did something that week. Um, but basically we did a lot of programming vir virtually only. We did a virtual Patriot's Day. And that whole week we had programming. And then we put all of that on our website, which was like the best, easiest way in a really high stress way um, to create a bunch of content and put it on the website. So that's all there. Our website is lexingtonhistory.org um, and the con digital content, there's a button right at the front, but it's, you know, lexingtonhistory.org backslash digital content. And that has any pre-recorded programs we have. Um, we have some school programming things. We have some scavenger hunts and things for kids, some like make it home activities. Um, we have videos of other programs we've done. Um, it's a pretty good spread. I mean, I'm a marketing person too. So I'm the one who's trying to like throw things on there as fast as I possibly can. Um, but that's the idea. And we have been doing, like I said, virtual programming straight through. So like in May, we had one lecture a week and we just did it all Zoom format. Um, in, in June, at the end of June, we have two lectures um, one we're collaborating and these are all virtual. So that's the beauty is that anybody, you guys can all come. Um, Thursday, June 25th, we have one on how radar helped to win World War II. Um, we're, we're obviously not just focused on Rev War in Lexington, although that is our bread and butter. Um, so we do have something on how radar helped win the war. Um, Lexington is also the home of the gentleman, Charles Ponzi, who started the Ponzi scheme. So it's the 100th anniversary of the Ponzi scheme. And we're wow. in a lecture um, on Ooh. June 30th with the local library on Charles Ponzi. Huh. So, so we have some fun. Like, that's my favorite part is that a lot of these virtual programs and lectures we've done have been just, you know, people who have a book who want to talk about it or some like our local library got Lois Lowry to do a virtual thing because, you know, she's home, she can do that. She doesn't have to fly to Lexington or, you know, something like that. So it's been fun, you know, doing these programs. And, 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 and also I've been really proud of our like 97 year old board members who were like, I figured out the Zoom. Yes, you did, <laughs> good job. <laughs> You're here and I'm so proud of you right now. <laughs> so it's been really, really fun seeing those things, you know, and seeing people enjoying them from a distance. Um, right. So yeah, check it out, lexingtonhistory.org. Right. I've been, like I said, I've been following all of you guys on social media. You guys are doing great work and um, doing our own pages here where I work. I know how much work it is. People don't realize how much goes into some of this oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, lots of planning and, and lots of effort. So um, when you open, I encourage everyone to go visit your facilities once we can safely open and get people back to the buildings. But for now, uh, virtually is the best way we can go. And you all are all doing great work on that. So I appreciate that. As a history person, uh, I appreciate that. Well, thank you, ladies, for, for being here tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, next week, we are back here at 7 o'clock with a very much overlooked topic, the War of 1812. We have some people talking about yeah. the burning of Washington, Fort McHenry, and lots of uh, different military action up, uh, up in the uh, Great Lakes area of New York. So we have a couple of good speakers for that. That will be next week at 7 o'clock. Um, we got some people asking us about our second annual ERW symposium on September 26. Uh, send your emails to Liz Williams for that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We do partner with Gatsby's Tavern on that event. And uh, we're, we, Liz and I are crossing our fingers. We can actually do it. So um, as everyone knows, we're still in, in different phases of reopening for COVID. So our, our hope is we can have our symposium this year on September 26th. But as soon as we get the word that we can have it, we'll post it to our website. Uh, we have some great speakers. We have, um, we have Mark Malloy talking about uh, Drunk Hessians and other myths of 10 crucial days. Travis Shaw talking about disinfected dangerous persons, the loyal resistance in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, John Reese is doing some great research on African-Americans in the Continental Army will be speaking. Uh, our good friend Vanessa Smiley will be talking about the war in the South. And then Michael Harris from Philadelphia is talking about the Battle of Brandywine. So we're looking forward, hopefully, of getting that off, but we'll have that on our website. So thank you all again for, for being here, taking your time to, to uh, join us tonight. I wish you all be, uh, be safe and we'll talk soon. And thank you everybody for watching. Good night. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, cheers.